Hello, everybody. Welcome to NEM 2022 by SCS. Hope everybody's doing well today. Just um, giving a few moments for everybody to join. Um, if you can, please take note to the chat box. Um, just a, a little bit of an instruction for any questions any of you may have. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hi, good afternoon, sorry. Hello. Hello. So to start, uh, to know better our participants for today, uh, we will have uh, some polls to know you better. So if you have, uh, can, you, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can, Alan. Yeah, Alex, we can see your screen yeah. Okay. Please, uh, if you can, uh, everyone, if you can go to Menti and use the code 21067488. So we can know you better and answer the some questions. Just type on your browsers www.menti.com or if you have on your phone, download the Mentimeter app. Yeah. Someone answered already by becoming a professional engineer. Still have only one answer from our participant. Guys. Wake up. I know. There we go. Okay. So becoming a professional engineer, alternative paths, options. Yeah, it's great. Work experience record. So far, eight participants. When can I submit my app? Mm -hmm. Future opportunities. Yeah. I think definitely we will talk. Hello. They, yeah. Yes, Tiama. I think by app they mean application. I think. Oh. So mostly it's becoming a professional engineer. I think. Uh mostly of our participants. Okay. Okay. 
that book. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So for the next question. Next question. Next. Okay. Next question. Where did you learn about today's event? No, mostly name promotion, social media. So we have more on name promotion. 30, 30, 40%. Wow. Well, <laughs> it's more on name promotion. Great. Okay. So next, uh, oh, wait. So next one, please use this code, uh, 4779 What program are you currently enrolled? Hmm? Civil engineering technician, others, oh. So we are not only in a civil engineering. Okay. There are more on the other field. For the other guy. Sorry, how do we uh, respond to these survey you. questions? Mm -hmm. Just go to menti.com, then type the code 4779-5178. Okay, Alexis, I think. Currently, what year of study are you? First year, third year, no, oh, mostly first year. So it's great that the new ones are attending. Me as well, I'm on my first year. Okay. I think we proceed for, for the third. Uh, please go to menti.com again, then use the code 3173-1152. On your own understanding, what is having B professional engineering? Mean? Okay, the new code is 3173-1152. Thank you, Alex. So become, being capable of designing, you know, it's great. How about the other guys? Responsibility, more opportunities, legitimate, helping Be the capable. public. Um, solving mm -hmm. skills. Yeah. Integrity, right? Engineer. Wow, a lot of people. A lot of good ideas. Yes. Okay. okay. Pass the professional test. Great. Great to hear your. Awesome. So for the next question, what do you think are the 
advantages of having a professional engineer title. What are some thoughts? Yes. Let's hear them. More <laughs> money. <laughs> that's, that's good. MTL quadrant. More working chances. In here, and reputation. Job opportunity. Really? Awesome. You mm -hmm. can use a PN chapter. Mm -hmm. Credibility, correct. Establish wow. good reputation, definitely. Awesome. Okay, then proceed for the next question. Awesome. Um, for the we last one. Hmm? This is the last question, right? Yes, uh, one last question. Perfect. Um, as for which speaker or talk are you more excited to learn from? We have the three speakers, Mr. Jonathan Han, Mr. Nan Lewin, and Mr. Justin Robinson. <clears throat> We want to know um, since they have uh, their own special power field. Who, who is the reason you're here? <laughs> yeah. oh, um, Professor Nanda, Professor Jonathan, and Mr. Justin. Well, it doesn't matter who comes first or second. Yes. Or third. We are grateful for all three yes. of you who are here yes. and helping us. Oh, We're tie. very thankful. Oh. <laughs> because they have their own uh, contribution for this uh, seminar as well. Somebody asked, if you don't know them, how can I rate them? Well, <laughs> that's true. By the end of the seminar, you will get to know them and you will get to know their contact or what they're presenting. So we will ask this question again once more at the end. Okay. Uh, just I first of all, are all three of these beings? Sorry. Um, sorry, we would also request that any attendees raise their hands moving forward um, so in order we can recognize your question. Um, I've posted the instructions for questions in the chat box already as well. So, what can they did right? Yeah, so I'm asking, I was asking the question, uh, the three speakers you identified here, are all of them be inches? Okay, I would, answer, I, I would answer this question. If you would wait till the program actually starts and they start speaking, they can introduce themselves and they will, you will find out then. Yeah. But to answer the question, uh, Mr. Nandalwin and Jonathan Hunt are professional engineers. And Justin Robinson is a professional recruiter. Okay. All right, Alexis, I think we're ready to start. Okay. I will stop my sharing. <laughs> okay. I will start. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you to the National Engineering Month or NAM session on how to become a professional engineer, which will begin with discussing how education, experience, career, drive, curiosity, and being a team member. Also, we will discuss how to become noticeable to stand out among other candidates from the perspective of the employers. Please note, this session will be recorded. First, I want to introduce to you, to you, you to your executive at Seneca Civil Society. First, yours truly, my name is Alexis John Villamarin, your secretary. Next is Mr. Franklin Gomez. Nice to meet president. you. Yes. Next is Ms. Rinku, our AV coordinator. Mr. Siddharth, our social media Hello. coordinator. 
our Armin Safarian, our treasurer. Theodore Rotaro, our student coordinator. And lastly, Sia Makgasi, our vice president. Perfect. Um, before we begin, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are coming to you from Toronto, which is in the dish with one spoon territory. We respectively acknowledge the past and present traditional stewards of the land and their unique role in the life of the region. Toronto is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples and is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and play in the territory. Without further delay, we would now like to begin the session. First, to ask advanced questions. During the presentation, please type them in the chat box. They will be addressed at the end of the whole presentation. Your executives will fully monitor the chat box or you will directly address your question to our speakers. Just raise your, just raise your hand after the presentation during the question answer portion for you to be noticed. Lastly, we would like to have your mic muted to show respect to our speakers. Everyone take note and listen carefully to our speakers because at the end of our program, you guys will play a game. Top three winners will win a prize. Our first speaker is graduate, uh, graduated from UFD and currently a professor at Seneca and a faculty member of School of Environmental and Civil Engineering Technology for the past 14 years. He is a geostructural engineer, a professional engineer, and has a master's degree in applied science. He is in the industry for the past six years. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Jonathan Hunt. Great, thank you everybody, thank you. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my slide presentation if that's okay with everybody. Um, that's perfect. Okay, can I confirm that you can see the uh, um, Seneca OSPE National Engineering Month logo. Yep. Everybody, okay, well, thank you for asking me to, uh, to join this presentation, this talk. I hope it uh, is uh, fruitful for everybody. Uh, I was uh, interested in the, uh, the topic, the theme this year, becoming an engineer, and I was given some um, thoughtful questions to perhaps uh, answer or muse about for a while, but um, I decided to speak to and I'll only be doing this briefly, uh, was a bit on the drive uh, because I, I realized some of the questions that were provided revolved around that. Also, some of my own personal reflections in life as I've gone through the process. Uh, the education, uh, an obvious element. The experience, uh, a requirement. The career, because it is uh, um, such an accomplishment to get that far uh, that you tend to live that life and that career and hope they're very fruitfully. And then a note about the, the team that uh, really supports you throughout all of this. So really in no particular order, and I could cycle back through all of these, um, this is not a simple question. It may be one that uh, is asked often, um, but that is indicative of it being a rather complicated uh, question. Really finding out what drives you um, is at the center of uh, the quest for whatever it is you want to, uh, to achieve. Uh, and, you know, whether it was an interest or curiosity in how things were built, playing with Legos uh, or school projects or um, just the awe-inspiring uh, feats that some people seem to accomplish in this field, you know, one of the things that you have to try to refer back to is what was that initial spark uh, and, and how do you keep it going? Now, curiosity uh, early in life, the challenge and the competition that you sometimes experience while in the programs and studying, these all kept, yeah, keep you moving forward. Compensation clearly is a question in everybody's mind. Um, but, you know, I believe why it's a difficult question to answer this drive component, and, you know, it, it'll come to you again and again and throughout life is that uh, your career aspirations and your core values will underline uh, all of that. 
all right, and, and really push you through um, the various hurdles that you'll find on your way to, um, to becoming a professional engineer. Now, I'll, 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 I'll point out the obvious. There is the educational requirement. Um, and I'm very thankful that, uh, that you ran that little Mentimeter um, questionnaire at the beginning because it, it allowed me to take a couple of snapshots uh, of these questions uh, that you yourself have as attending this uh, um, talk and allowed me to get a, a general idea of the audience, which was uh, interesting to find out that there are plenty of people with other backgrounds. I was assuming uh, like in past uh, NAN events, there would be a lot of uh, Seneca uh, students. Uh, nonetheless, um, I, I wanna speak to, to try to speak to all of you. So for those of you um, aware of the PN status, um, you probably also are aware that there is a, a requirement to have an accredited engineering degree, all right? And there is a difference between the degree and the diploma level programs. They are designed for particular job applications and job uh, um, features, right? But as you hear me talk later, it's incredibly important that they all work together as a team. So nonetheless, there's a bit of a gap there and you have to try to bridge that gap. Uh, there are plenty of qualified and, and high quality programs outside of, uh, of Canada that can be considered and, and uh, accredited uh, on the individual basis. But for those students who are graduating from uh, Seneca's civil engineering technology program in the near future or recently, um, you know, there are some fantastic pathways that are already outlined. And if you do get a chance, uh, I, I, I will share my presentation publicly. These, um, these crests and uh, th these underlined words, they're, they're linked to the resources. And um, the, um, the, the resources are going to be much clearer than I will be. So if you click on uh, the pathways link, it'll bring you to more descriptions about the various programs that are available from diploma to degree. Uh, Ontario Transfer also uh, is a website that uh, offers more information. I like to highlight uh, the Lakehead um, program because uh, for two reasons, it is accredited. So you see here the Canadian uh, Engineering Accreditation Board. It's officially the, uh, uh, the board that reviews degree programs in Canada and certifies them as meeting the various engineering standards. All right, um, that is a hurdle. Uh, if you can go to a degree program as accredited, you're, you're a little step closer, right? Uh, the other reason why I mentioned Lakehead is because it's a post-diploma, and that is a, a very unique thing in the program. Uh, but I hold these other programs in high regard and, and many others. Um, now, there are common linkages across all of them. It was noted in my introduction that I'm a, a grad from U of T. When I look at all of these programs, even our own diploma program, there are clearly common links uh, that will support you. And as you get into, um, you know, into further studies, which I hope would be a component of your entire life, all right, um, you'll find that uh, those, those common links are there for a reason to build support you, right? Uh, I don't want to take too much time on any one slide, so I'm going to move to the next one here in the experience. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Ontario Society for Professional Engineers to, uh, to host this event. Um, and I, I want to point out that um, um, I know they, uh, they work closely with Professional Engineers of Ontario. Um, it is through the Professional Engineers of Ontario, though, that you'll find the, um, the various or the specific requirements and many details about how you actually initiate the process. And I'm just going to highlight um, three of them here. One, it, as I mentioned, it have, you have to uh, fulfill the uh, academic requirements. Now, there are pathways for those people who have a diploma and many years of experience to getting a PH. There are pathways for people who have a degree outside of Canada or a non-accredited degree to getting a PNG. The, the, the website, the PEO's website, again, this is linked to it, uh, can give you lots of information on that. Uh, but ultimately, academics is one component. Then there are some additional law and ethics exams. So they note them here as the national professional practice exams. Uh, plenty of resources there online at the PEO's website. But more importantly is the work experience. And I have a separate uh, slide about the career because I do feel experience and career are you know, uh, worth distinguishing from each other. What's important is that you reflect on your experience and part of the requirement to, to getting a PNG is that reflection piece and understanding how showing you uh, can apply the theory properly, uh, understanding your role in practice, management of engineering and projects and understanding 
uh, how they, they are initiated throughout all phases. Communication is absolutely critical. I'll be emphasizing that again in a moment. And on just the overall awareness of the social imp uh, implications. That is something that I think most people, regardless of what program you're in, can appreciate and understand and look around the world. Right? Um, put pretty plainly though, early in your career as you're collecting this experience, you really will have to master the fundamentals. Right? You'll actually have to start practicing a specific niche. Uh, you'll have to refine your analytical skills uh, and your communication skills through that routine and, and mastery of fundamentals. Ultimately, as you get a few years of experience and you work towards that designation that you want, what you're really capable of doing, uh, what you really understand well, is that you can identify a problem in your uh, field of vision. Right? You can articulate that problem to a client or to a team member, and then you can solve and deliver on that problem. And uh, you know, it, it seems um, um, like it, it may uh, seem sort of mundane to go through engineering problems that are um, uh, written up in engineering textbooks, uh, you know, in such plain language. Uh, but ultimately, when you get a complex real world problem, you do boil it down to some simple word problem that you can understand and that you can actually solve in, in, in an orderly uh, a manner with applying the appropriate theory. So this is a major part. The experience is a major part of, of getting to that uh, ultimate goal, that status, uh, that post-nominal, um, but it, it takes some careful reflection. Um, and those, those reflective pieces are written up and reviewed by the people as part of that. Okay, I'm going to be, well, a little bit more open, I guess, with this career. Uh, I was asked in some of my, in some of the questions and uh, was provided with some leading questions about my own personal career. And I, and I don't tend to go into any of that, um, but I have reflected on that. And I think that anybody um, uh, who's lucky enough uh, to get started in um, a related field of engineering needs to recognize that there's going to be a lot of practice in the early years. And by that, I mean routine, you know, the, the, um, the ability to um, uh, repeat some of the fundamentals again and again and again, whether that's surveying, drafting, calculations, uh, lab work, field work, whatever that is. But it's for good reason, because you do need to become a master in one particular field uh, in order to become a professional. And uh, your, your education, as important as it is, is very broad for a reason, but doesn't allow you to become a master. So you will be um, experiencing quite a bit of routine in those early years as you build your skill set. If you're lucky, um, uh, and I believe most people are, and they're aware of this, a very key role in the overall development is finding a good mentor, uh, somebody who's uh, recently gone through that same process and is kind enough to show you everything about it, not to keep any guarded secrets, but say, hey, these are the, these are the ways uh, that we solve these problems and opens up the you know, business practice, the consulting practice, or the, the applications and, and shows you these are step-by-step -steps how you go through it. Uh, there's lots more I could potentially say about that, but it's, you know, everybody's career is going to be different. Uh, I'm, again, thankful that the word cloud was, uh, or these mentee um, uh, questions were asked, because uh, I noted that many people aren't going to be taking that typical civil path. Uh, and I can appreciate that there is uh, going to be many careers based on those different, uh, um, um, different avenues. Uh, but one thing that I think might be common to all people's careers is that there's going to be some surprises. There's, there's, there's going to be some upsets or perhaps different roads that you have to take that aren't really within your plan. Um, I refer back to the slide on, on drive and understanding what drives you because whatever the problem is, you're likely going to be able to work through it if you understand what it is that you want. All right. So um, there's lots more than any one person can say about their particular career. I've included just a couple of uh, um, snippets of what I would do in a day-to-day -day practice in shoring design. Um, but you know, there is much more diversity uh, and, and, and you know, there's a much broader world in the engineering um, sphere alone. Uh, and so I think that anybody's career is really just uh, a collection of, of the various goals that people set us, uh, ahead of them and, and work towards. Now, the last one that I wanna talk about is really the team. Um, and over the years, I've had the pleasure of working with some really great teams. And I'm going to be honest, many of the teams have had elements of Seneca grads that I've either taught or, or you know, I've, I, get to, I get to work with. Um, even recently, uh, working with uh, some fantastic, um, talented 
graduates of our program and of Lakehead and of others. Uh, but the important thing about the team is, is that you appreciate that everybody brings a certain skill set. Um, that in the world of engineering, uh, there are internal teams, there are broader teams. Uh, internally, you have to appreciate that you know within your group, uh, there will be roles defined for individuals to achieve a certain outcome. All right, and every one of those roles is essential. Right, whether it's from data collection and field uh, and lab activities, uh, or um, drafting and report writing, cl client facing, you need to be able to, as I said in an earlier slide, articulate that problem, all right, solve it, and deliver. And that's what's really uh, important about the, uh, the engineering team. There's also the broader uh, team, the external team um, in uh, the application of civil engineering and civil projects you have a client who will engage multiple consultants, whether that's uh, architects, construction managers, structural engineers, geotechnical engineers, mechanical, electrical engineers, you'll have the opportunities to, to work together, um, you know, virtually or in person, group meetings, through email. What you need to remember is that you are working primarily to a goal, solving some problem, right? Delivering on some uh, demand, with everybody that is a part of your team internally or, or externally. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that you'll appreciate going through this program, or if you've already gone through it and graduated, or if you go through you know, the, the, the challenges of a, a degree program, is that you will build a team, right? You can, do, you can do the education on your own. It's challenging. You can't do the engineering practice on your own. You need a team. So I would encourage anybody who's still in the, in the education uh, segment or phase of their life that, that you appreciate the teamwork and the strategies that teams uh, allow you to build um, and practice while, uh, while you work through your education. Take those same skills and apply them in, uh, uh, in your career and you'll be quite successful because you'll need the team to ultimately get to your final goal. Okay, um, I'm just gonna conclude with, you know, I, I am also a teacher, I have been for many years. Uh, I'm happy to be practicing and as I said, uh, working with some of my past students and so, uh, you know, I think it's, maybe it's just because I'm a teacher, I'm gonna apply some uh, Bloom's taxonomy or verbs to this. You know, the drive, you really need to understand your own personal drive, what you really want. Education, you need to apply it. You won't be applying all of it, but you will certainly be applying quite a bit of that theory and understanding how other people apply it. Your experience is important because you need to reflect on it uh, and use it to better yourself. And your career is ahead of you. Challenges and rewards, all of it, meet it, do the best you can. Uh, to work through it. Uh, but remember that you're working through it often with a team. I was uh, reflecting on, on one of the questions that I was given at the, to, to inspire me to, to write something. You know, what was your proudest moment? Um, honestly, there are a couple of moments that I'm quite proud of, but none of them were achieved entirely independently. All right. Um, so even my own personal journey to getting my PhD and all that it entailed, you know, I gotta thank my my wife for being part of my team that helped me get there, as well as other people who supported me. So that's an important aspect uh, to this whole thing. It's it can be very much an individual endeavor, but it doesn't have to be, and it really shouldn't be. I think you'll be far more successful and happy if you um, use a bit of teamwork throughout. All right, uh, I'll end it there, and thank you for your time. If there are any questions, I think we probably have to save them to the end. Yes, thank you, Professor Jonathan, um, for speaking today. <laughs> and yes, we are saving all your questions for the end. So just keep putting them in the chat box. Our moderators are making a note of them. Um, now we move on to our second speaker, Mr. Professor Nanda Lewin. Um, handing it off to Niha now. Our second speaker holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Toronto and master's degree in engineering and public policy from McMaster University. He has worked in both structural and transportation engineering while employed at NCK Engineering in Toronto. He fulfilled a childhood dream by working on the structural rehabilitation program of the CN Tower, then the world's tallest free standing structure. A licensed professional engineer is the is the province of Ontario. He served as chair of the Willows, Willowdale Thornhill chapter of Professional Engineering Ontario, PEO, for four years, 
from 2011 to 2013, and again from 2018 to 2020. He sits on PEO's East Central 30 by 30 committee. He is a member of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers and the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. In 2015, he, he was made a Fellow of Engineer Canada in recognition of his contribution and service to the engineering profession. Okay, so he began teaching at Humber College in Toronto in two, 2003, and he then at Seneca College the following year. In his capacity as professor, he was represented on Seneca's Professional Development Committee, Chair of the Academic Honesty Committee of the School of Environmental and Civil Engineering Technology, and also co-founded the student run Seneca Civil Society. He was a cast member of Friday at 4, Seneca's weekly online staff party. In 2021, he established the Nandalovin Civil Engineering Technology Award for students in financial need. And in 2022, Professor Nguyen was inducted as an officer into the PO Order of Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Nguyen. Wow, thank you so much for that introduction. <laughs> And that, that picture of me is from, is from Facebook, isn't it? I haven't seen that photo in years. But anyway, thank you so very, very much for having me. I, I, I was, um, I'm touched by that, that um, by the, the introduction. I wasn't expecting that. And I wasn't expecting that photo, but anyway. Um, so thank you everybody for having me. Um, uh, President Martinez Gomez, uh, sent me a bunch of questions and um, it inspired me to come up with this. Um, this, uh, let's see if we can do this. Um, let's come up with this uh, slide presentation. Can you see it? And yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Because um, I can't. <laughs> Uh, we can see it. It's just, it looks like it's in the, it's not in presenter mode. No, it isn't. So if we just press F5. Yeah. Yeah, you could start now. And you just press enter or the, you can change slide by enter. Right. So, um, President uh, Martinez Gomez, his questions, he, he asked quite a few questions, inspired this, this, um, this uh, slide presentation, engineering and eight random thoughts. And so I thought that we would go over some of those questions uh, with the slide presentation and eight random thoughts. So here we go. Random thought number one, the CN Tower is where it all began for me. Um, so uh, President Gomez uh, was asking me, I get inspired to be uh, an engineer. And it was when I was seven years old, uh, back in 1978, that my parents actually took me, yes, I'm that old, by the way, that they took me to this new building, this new tourist attraction in downtown Toronto called the CN Tower. And I was very, very impressed with it. I, I thought that this was this was awesome. I thought as a as a young child it was it was great, and and I remember being a young child uh, uh, at the base of the tower, and we got my brother and I got these photographs generated by computer. And back in 1978, that was a big deal. So this was really high tech, and this was fantastic. And I asked my father, who's a professional engineer, um, a, about the engineering about this building, and he told me. Uh, one simple thing, he said that the structural engineer is the one who, who makes sure it stands and um, the architect is the one that makes it all, makes it look nice and makes it look, look aesthetically pleasing. And so I thought from that day on, I was going to be either one of them, preferably a, a structural engineer, because my father's an engineer, like what I said, uh, so I wanted to be just like my dad, just like everybody else, right? So... About 20 years later, uh, it comes all full circle because with an engineering degree, I actually ended up working at the tower. I worked at the, uh, at the tower in the rehabilitation, structural rehabilitation program um, of the tower. And um, it, it was a really nice job. Um, it was something I was really proud of. Um, so one of the things that 
uh, I did was, for example, we, we checked the, uh, the concrete, the condition of the concrete. It's a, it's a constantly a, a thing at the tower where we just, uh, we, we um, constantly, uh, you know, week after week, we, we check the concrete, right? So that was one of the things we did, what, one of the things I did personally. And we also checked the glass floor. We, uh, we just, uh, have, have, have you been on the glass floor before? I can't see the chat, but, but I'm, I'm assuming that some of you have been on the glass floor. Well, back in 2001, I was part of the, the, uh, the team that actually, actually tested the glass floor uh, to make sure that it's, um, uh, to make sure it's strong. Um, and also, um, it was, uh, it was our team that, that made sure that, that we, we checked the performance of the tower, the overall performance of the tower. So it's really amazing how in life um, things come full circle, right? I began uh, dreaming, if you will, of the CN Tower, being inspired by the CN Tower, and I ended up um, working at the tower. I didn't, uh, I didn't really uh, intend to do that uh, as an adult, but uh, it happened, and, and I was glad to have been part of it, very proud of, to have been part of it. So the next slide. Random thought number two, be in it for the right reasons. In other words, this could be pretty much subtitled, what is the, the working, uh, what is the work of, the, of a civil engineer like? Um, here's the truth about civil engineering. Um, it's rewarding. Um, it's uh, very fulfilling. Uh, the work can be very interesting, but I have to admit, the pay is mediocre. <laughs> um, I'm going to be very, very honest with you. Um, I think uh, the pay is not great, and I say that because if you take into account the liability and the risk and the amount of education, the credentials, and the contribution you make to society, it probably doesn't pay as much as you think it does. Now, that said, that said, it, it is a great profession to be part of. Um, it is something that um, I'm proud to be part of. And it's something that you might be, uh, be uh, proud to be part of. I have to warn you though, um, you should do it for the right reasons, right? Do it because you're passionate about the field. Do it because you're passionate about your community. Do it because you're passionate about infrastructure and you're passionate about um, uh, the links that link all of us in society, like subways, buses, um, roads, air, airports, airlines, airliners, sorry, airports, I should say. Do it because of those things, right? But don't do it because you think you're gonna get a lot of money out of it, because chances are you probably won't, right? If, if you wanna make money, there are other things to do, but, uh, but engineering is something that you'll make a great living of and, um, and, and you can find uh, a career which is rewarding and, and fulfilling, but do it for the right reasons, right? Here's another random thought. What's engineering school like? Well, Engineering school is very interesting. It's unlike any other professional uh, school, um, such as dentistry or law or, or medicine. Um, it takes you straight from high school and there's no prerequisites, right? It's, it's very, it's very, um, it's very unique in that way. Um, it's a four year program. Uh, for those of you who've taken college, if you go to Lakehead, it's two years, but usually it's a four year program. It's, um, it's very tough, <clears throat> it's a lot of work. And trust me, and, and Professor Hunt probably can attest to this, that they get you working from, from, uh, from the earliest uh, hour in the morning to, to late at night. I've had lots of late nights. Almost every night in, in engineering school was a late night. Um, it was, it was a, a real heavy load and, um, and it was really challenging. So you better, if you're going into engineering school, you better really want it because it's gonna make you work. Um, there's an assumption that I've noticed over the 18 years I've, I've been a teacher that um, it's, it's a continuation of college. 
that it's a lot like community college. It really isn't, to be quite honest with you. The, the courses I think you'll find are, are less practical and they're more academic um, and the workload is much heavier. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk lately um, about how some engineering schools are, are kind of disconnected from, from the workplace. So what you learn at the University of Toronto or any other university, um, you may not, uh, it may not reflect of what's, what's in the workplace and the skills that you're, you're required in the workplace. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but engineering school, uh, the bottom line is it's, it's tough and you better want to do it. So that's another random thought. Here's another random thought and something that I get asked a lot, what is the best engineering school to go to? Well, the best engineering school to go to is the one that will take you from being a college student in this case, or a high school student to becoming a professional engineer. That is the best engineering school. Um, I, I had a colleague, uh, she was from the University of Waterloo and she and I always would, would um, we would, we would, there was a friendly rivalry between us when we first met and we just kind of playfully poked each other's schools. Like she poked fun at U of T, I poked fun at Waterloo and it was kind of a game. But, and she, she seems to really, if you will, be obsessed with that question, uh, which is the better engineering school. But I think it's a bit of a ridiculous question because, um, you know, all of them are good. All of them are credited. All of them will lead you to being a professional engineer. So, you know, it doesn't really, um, it really doesn't, uh, that question is, 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 a bit, is a bit frivolous in, in my opinion. Um, so, so keeping that in mind, um, if you really must know, here's a list um, and I'm gonna show it to you here. McLean's Magazine, uh, this is their, their list of the, of the top engineering schools in the country. Um, University of Toronto um, uh, regularly is number one throughout the different surveys. And I'm not saying that as a University of Toronto grad. Um, it's, it's pretty much, there's like five different major surveys. And I think it's, it's number one on four of those five surveys in Canada. So this is McLean's. It tends to be the most sought out one in this country. And so Toronto is number one. Um, about you know being in the top school, it's nice if you can get into U of T or Barlow, but I don't think it's necessary if, if you're wondering. Um, and, and I say that because, I mean, you look at some of the examples out there, right? I know a lot of great engineers who, who went to, to other universities other than some of the top ones you're, you're seeing on your screen right now. Um, a lighthearted example, Judge Judy. I mean, if you, if you know um, the show Judge Judy, Judith Scheinlin didn't go to the best law school. And yet she's, uh, she's one of the most successful uh, TV personalities uh, in, well, I'm sure she's the most uh, famous graduate out, out of, um, out of uh, New York Law School, but I mean, it, she didn't go to the best, best law school. Stephen Harper, regardless of what you think of him, was our prime minister for 10 years, almost 10 years. And he went to the University of Calgary. It's hardly a Harvard University. It's hardly an Ivy League University. It's, it's not Trinity College. So the thing of the, the point I'm trying to get at is, is it's not really important what university you go to. It's just make sure that you go to a university that will get you to where you want to go as soon as possible. Next slide. Here's another random thought. I made friends and, and contacts, sorry, my screen is a bit, through networking and engineering. It's true, I've, um, it's a bit of a cliche, but, but it's true that, that networking is important. Uh, by the way, this is a picture of me chairing a meeting with Willowdale Thornhill. Um, I, I decided that I was gonna use a lot of the photos that no one's ever seen before. So this is, this is, a, this is a, a good way of doing that. Um, so I was involved, I've been involved in a, in a volunteer basis uh, with PEO for 17 years now. Um, I was chair of the Willowdale Thornhill chapter for four non-consecutive years uh, as 
as the introduction stated, from 2011 to 2013, and again from 2018 to uh, 2020. Some of the people that I meet um, in those meetings have become friends of mine and they become contacts. And a lot of times when, when a lot of you send me emails asking me to find you a, a job or a position, I reach out to those people. Um, I, I suggest, and I, as cliche and as, as, um, as uh, uh, trite as this sounds, um, you know, it's important that you go out there and make the, net, uh, make the contacts, make the friends to network, right? Um, I've been part of OSPI, for example, uh, this very uh, organization that's co-hosting uh, for 10 years, uh, for example. I've been uh, 10, 10 consecutive years. And, um, and this very organization, the uh, Seneca Civil Society, um, I helped co-found it with students back in 2014. I'm so glad that it's uh, doing that. Next slide. Is it possible for a college grad to become a professional engineer? This was uh, a picture of me taken at one of the Seneca uh, convocations that I go to. Uh, that's a question that I get asked a lot and I thought I would address that one. So theor theoretically, yes. Yes, it is possible to go straight from a college like Seneca to become a professional engineer, but keep in mind that you have to take about, I think it's about 18 different technical tests. They're not easy tests. They're tests, um, after you work for a little while, you're asked to take about 18 tests to, um, that will lead to uh, licensure, to, uh, that will lead to, to licensing. Uh, so that's a lot of tests. And I'm gonna tell you one thing, I'm saying this as a professional engineer, I don't recommend you doing that. <laughs> I recommend that you go to engineering school and you work, get the work experience and then and get the credentials that, uh, that, you, uh, that you seek and then get the, get the license. I think that's a much uh, better way because the thing is, is you don't really, you don't really want to, uh, even if you do uh, go straight from college to become a professional engineer, you don't want to be thinking for the rest of your life, well, what was it like if I went to engineering school? What was it? What would have my career have been? Um, it would have changed at all if I were if I were if I went to uh, engineering school. So I think that's a very important um, component to go to engineering school, and I think you should. Uh, um, I think that would be the route to take to go to engineering school. Just to get, give you an idea, I've met literally hundreds of engineers over the of the past few years, uh, after, over the past uh, let's say twenty years. Um, I've met them in my capacity as a graduate of the University of Toronto. I've met them as a, uh, as in my capacity um, as a Seneca professor. I've met them um, in my capacity as, as chair of Willowdale Thornhill and, and uh, my, my work in PEO. And I have never met anybody who is a professional engineer and, and has a college diploma. I've seen them, I've seen people who have college diplomas and engineering degrees and who are professional engineers, but I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about people who just have a college diploma. Um, I've never met anybody like that. That said, I know that they exist. I know that they're out there, but I've not, I've not met them. So keep that one in mind. I'm, if I may say, yes, uh, and you, you, you are right. Uh, there are not many examples like that, but one of our past uh, presidents, be your president, David Brown, and you may remember him, actually yep. doesn't have an engineering degree. He has college diploma. Um, and probably no. he did uh, some courses, I don't know, but he doesn't have a B.Tech or bachelor's, and but he ended up getting a PhD. Um, he, he, I know David Brown. Um, he, he has a, a bachelor's degree uh, from Queens University. Um, I, I think, think he, he, went, he graduated from St. Lawrence said, College. Engineering sorry. technologist. I'm sorry? sorry to interrupt both of you. Uh, due to the time slot that we have, uh, we need to uh, uh, like you know move to the next speaker as well. Right. If you don't mind, if you can give us a summary. Right. Um, so, um, just one one uh, one thing. Uh, David Brown actually, he and I have had a great conversation, and he says he actually prefers hiring technology. So there you go. Um, 
Another random plot, Professional Engineering Day in Ontario is a great opportunity to celebrate our profession. So this is a picture of me and George Carberry, who used to be president of uh, PEO, um, and he's an acquaintance of mine. And we were at Queen's Park back in 2018. Um, we were at the Ontario Legislature, and uh, we actually got to see uh, the politicians at Queen's Park pass a motion to make Professional Engineers Day uh, a reality uh, in Ontario. And it was a great day. Um, you know, you go to the, the legislature and as, as it is their custom, your MPP, in this case, it was my MPP at the time was David Zimmer shown here. Um, he, uh, you know, he along with his fellow MPPs, they, um, they, uh, they actually announce who in the house uh, is, is a guest and a guest of theirs and uh, is there for, to see the motion being passed for, uh, for Professional Engineers Day. So that was a great day. Uh, that was March the 1st, 2018. That was four years ago. Um, it was terrific. So finally, um, CM Mook is probably raising his hand because he wants me to finish. But um, the last thing I wanted to tell you, the last random thought I have is to start in engineering and go anywhere. If you're in a position right now where you think that um, you're not very sure about engineering, just stay where you are right now. Uh, particularly if, you've, if you're almost finished, finish it, work for a little while and see where it takes you. Um, I've, I've had many examples where, where you know, people have done other things in life. Like I never thought, for example, if you were to tell me on the steps of convocation on June 9th, 1993, when I was at U of T, that I was going to become a teacher, I would have just laughed in your face. I never, I never dreamed that this would happen. And um, a classmate of mine, Peter Intraligi, for example, he, um, he practiced, uh, well, he went through engineering school with me, and then he went on to get an MBA. And uh, he became president of, um, uh, of uh, Invesco. And, um, and then there's uh, my other classmate, Greg Ovis, who uh, went on to have his own business in the fire alarm business. So, you know, it's really what you make of it, right? And I would encourage all of you to, to keep plugging at it and to make sure that, um, to make sure that uh, uh, you, you do the best you can and uh, you, you aspire to great heights. And so thank you very much. That's, uh, that's my presentation for today. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you uh, for Alex, uh, particularly for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a speaker, Professor Thank Nandelman. You. Thank you. Um, now, without further ado, our last speaker, Mr. Justin Robinson. Siddharth. Hello, everybody. Hope you're enjoying the event. And thank you for the really interesting presentation, Professor Nanda. Um, so our next speaker is a proud alumni of Seneca College. He has 11 years of experience in professional recruiting in engineering. Currently, he is working as a senior recruiter for one of Canada's leading contracting and construction management organization, Graham Construction. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Justin Robinson. Thanks, Siddharth. Appreciate it. Hopefully you can all hear me all right. Um, yes. I'm just going to share my slides as well and as i know we're crunch for time i will try to hammer through it as quickly as possible um, so as siddharth was saying um, my name is justin robinson i have 11 years of recruitment experience primarily in construction and engineering uh, a little bit of mining as well and I, I put a brief description of myself in here. I won't get into it too much, um, but Sarth is right. I do work with Graham Construction. They're one of the leading national general contractors in Canada. I think if you had the rate, the top five largest, you would have Acon, Elliston, PCL, Leadcore, and Graham are kind of the five top ones. Graham is an employee-owned contractor, and uh, I am a proud partial owner. <laughs> 
All right, so avenues to explore. So one thing that I do have to preface this by saying is when I was initially asked to come and, and give some advice on how to enter the market post-graduating and how to aim yourself towards getting your first job, I expected a lot of the attendees to be part of the Seneca College CET program. And I have noticed that there are some of you that are from other programs and perhaps even bachelor's programs from uh, universities. A lot of this stuff does still apply, um, but just keep that in mind that there is a caveat that most of this is directed towards the CET grads. So the avenues to explore for most graduates, you know, you have construction, design engineering, architecture and engineering consulting. Just to touch on those really quickly, construction is those that are building the actual product. Design engineering are those that are designing the product. Architecture is the ones that are essentially imagining the project or the product. And they're more of an artistic standpoint in that sense. And it's the way that I help distinguish the two of them. And then engineering consulting tends to be the ones that are looking at a project, a service, a product, any of those things. And they're consulting on a day-to-day -day basis for the client. And that client could be a contractor, general contractor, constructor, could be a developer, could be an architect, could be you know, a, an industry leader, right? Or a government. So there's a lots of different options there. In terms of construction, um, specifically the vertical that I'm in right now, you're looking at estimating project coordination, design coordination, quality control, site management, field engineering are the typical positions that CET grads enter into in their first role, okay? Um, where do most CET grads land? Uh, they typically land in one of these three things, general contracting, a developer that builds for themselves. Some examples of that are like a center court, a lifetime, broccolini, first golf. These are developers that will purchase land with the mentality of making money <laughs> and develop that land and then also build on the land. Not all developers actually build. Right? So a lot of developers will invest and then they'll hire a general contractor to actually build their product. So there are developers out there that build for themselves. And that's kind of the number two area that most CET grads land. And then the third is engineering consulting. Now, my previous two speakers downloaded a lot of information to you. And a lot of it, I agree with full, full heartedly. And something that um, Nando had mentioned was getting into engineering consulting as a PN, you're, you're typically having to go back to school if you're a college grad, but that doesn't necessarily defeat the process of getting involved with engineering consulting without having that PN professional designation. There is opportunities within some of those larger consultants, like the EXPs, the SNCs, the Stantex, where you can get involved in maybe different ways. So it's always worthwhile building those connections and networking. I agree, like the previous two speakers said, networking is really important. And if you haven't started networking now, you're already behind. I think going forward, the most important thing that I can share with all of you today is that to enter the market and to get your first job, and this was touched on previously, right? Your drive, your passion, do it for the right reasons. You can boil that down to what Simon Sinek says is the why, right? What is your why? And I've worked with countless hiring managers at this point, and even the majority of them at Graham, they all have their own unique spin on what they're looking for, especially when it's involving a new graduate, but they all have one core principle. They want to know you and why you're doing this, right? What your why is, is not how much money you're going to make. It's not the specific job you're going to do. It's the core principle of why you want to be what you want to be. And I know it's hard to decide on that so early in your life. And that's why I highly recommend Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. 
it helps you break that down to kind of really discover who you are as a person and what your passion is and what you want to do with that passion. And that's the most important tidbit of information I can give you today. Every interview that you go into going forward, you need a good story and that story starts with why. Okay, this is just a little bit more about why, just to kind of help prompt you, right? Number one, what do you want to be remembered for? Why is it important to you? And what kind of projects do you want to be involved in and why? Nando talked about the CN Tower. I think there's a lot of really interesting and fascinating projects in the Toronto market, in the Ontario market in general, that are really important, okay? Whether it's with a university, a college, a government, there's many different things that you can get involved in. There's well over, I would say $20 billion of transit projects in the pipeline right now, for example, that are coming through our government entities. In addition to that, there's countless buildings projects. So think about what you want to actually build. What do you want to do? You got to build your brand. And I had this here because for me, I like to think about what my brand is and like, I like to develop an image of what my brand is going to be. You are all right now, starting upon graduating, starting before graduation, you're a brand and you need to be able to market your brand accordingly. Your brand has to have values. It has to have a motto. It has to have a reason for doing what it's doing. It's almost like owning your own business and your own business is you. My own business is Justin Robinson, right? Whether you own your own business or not, you do have your own business and you have to start with that. So in my brand, this is kind of my thought process of what my brand represents. And it is on my LinkedIn profile. You can view it later, so I won't go through it now, but it is an example of that. Steps to take. Okay, so going forward, the best things that you can do to get that first job, to land that first job, are a few things like this, right? So your LinkedIn profile, design your LinkedIn profile around your brand. The LinkedIn profile, as you enter, whether it's engineering, construction, consulting, it's gonna be important for you going forward. It helps you to network. It's an easy source to gather information. In fact, <laughs> the, uh, the student body that asked me to do this found me on LinkedIn and reached out to me on LinkedIn. And I, it's very important that you get, your, get yourself out there, right? And the easiest way to put yourself out there is through social media at the start. Is it the end all and be all? Definitely not, but it's the start, right? So add points of interest, talk about your why. These are things you wanna add. Your resumes and cover letters, I constantly get asked this question. I've gone to a number of these types of presentations, career fairs, different things um, within the schools. And everyone asks me, how do I set my resume apart from all of my peers? And let's be realistic. There's a lot of folks graduating, especially over the last couple of years through the pandemic, that are coming out and everyone's resume kind of looks the same, right? A lot of folks don't have experience yet. It's that chicken or the egg, right? You need experience to get a job. You need a job to get experience. So you have to highlight the things that are going to set you apart from all of your other peers, because realistically, you know, graduate A and graduate B are going to look almost entirely the same on paper. So you have to think about ways of helping yourself stand apart, you know, whether it's that's your hobbies, that's, you know, maybe a website you designed and, uh, or a business that you created or anything that sets you apart and represents your brand, okay? Do, do actually try to put some thought into the formatting. If anyone wants any details or any more in-depth discussion on that, I can get into that at a later date. Um, I don't have a ton of time right now, but the best thing I can tell you is that anyone, whether they're a project manager or an engineer, when they're looking to hire and you put five resumes in front of them, the one that's visually striking tends to be the first one they pick up. And then tailor your approach. Reach out and develop rapport. And rapport is not developed, and this is really important, it is not developed through talking about the weather. <laughs> you build rapport by asking good questions and responding accordingly. 
and ensuring that you're demonstrating that you're interested in what that other person has to say. Okay, so you really want to be able to start getting out there and speaking with people, right? So put the effort into making a good first impression. Even though we live in a very media focused technological kind of renaissance of an age, a good smile and a firm handshake goes a long way. And that's still true today. Uh, the importance of networking, again, I can't necessarily, you know, put a massive spotlight on this, but it is an important thing. And the best way to learn how to ride a bike is to keep pedaling, all right? You gotta keep pedaling. And it's the same with networking, right? It's the same with motivation, in fact, right? Zig Ziglar once said that motivation is like showering. You know, you, you have to do it every day, right? And it's the same with networking. Networking is also like showering. You gotta do it every day. Otherwise that network dies. You need to be out there. You need to be speaking with people. You need to be getting in front of folks. And that's how you get that first job. It's gonna be someone that you connect with nine times out of 10 that is gonna to lead to your first job rather than an application you send into what we call the black void of the internet, okay? <clears throat> so getting your first, uh, first position, right? So just to reiterate, you gotta stand out amongst your peers. You have to manage through an interview process, right? Speak to your why, understand your brand, have passions and hobbies in hand because you're not gonna necessarily look a whole lot different than the guy that comes in behind you. You're gonna have the same level of experience. You're both new graduates, right? So you have to start speaking to the things that set you apart. And every hiring manager that is on any of our career fairs, when they're asked this question, they always speak to personality, always. What's their personality like? If I have two resumes in front of me, maybe one's a little bit more visually striking than the other, but not necessarily outmatches them. They get them in front of, in front of them, and the person with the non-visually striking resume performs better as a person and has a personality and has a why and has a passion for doing what they're doing and has an interest and can build rapport, they're gonna get the job, right? These are all just little things that you need to start putting together to create the perfect package, right? And applying versus networking. Again, like I said, your first job nine times out of 10 is gonna come from someone you connect with a person, right? Not an internet web page. Now, that does not discredit applying. You should still apply. I'm not saying you shouldn't. You should always apply. But what do you do once you apply? Leverage your network. Get in front of someone. Speak to someone you know, or someone that you've gotten to know, or someone that you're about to get to know, and let them know that your resume is in someone's inbox. and reach out to me anytime. Um, this is my email address at Graham, it's my LinkedIn profile there. And I do have the presentation link there at the bottom if you wanted to revisit it, it is online. You can access it anytime at your leisure. If you have any questions, um, we're gonna go into Q&A now, I believe. And uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. Thanks for having me. Good luck, everyone. You're all gonna blaze your own trails and I think there's a lot of opportunity within Toronto, especially over the next few years, to get heavily involved in any of these aspects, whether it's engineering, construction, or any combination of those things. It's an exciting time, and you just got to remember, keep pedaling the bike. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. John, Justin Robinson. Uh, Mr. Jonathan, Mr. Nanda, Mr. Justin, thanks for spending your time presenting for us today. Uh, I would like to present to you our certificate of appreciation from Seneca Civil Society. Can you show the certificate? Uh, present the certificate of appreciation for sharing their valuable knowledge and experience about becoming a professional engineer at the National Engineering Month, Ontario 2022, through a technical seminar held online given this 
first day of March in the year of our Lord 2022, having a team furthering knowledge in the field, signed by Bastan al Qadi, semi Civil Society Advisor, Franklin Martins Gomez, semi Civil Society President, and Mr. Siamak Gas Society Vice President. Theodore, you can proceed for the Q&A portion. Sorry, for I had myself muted. My apologies. Uh, listening to our speakers today made my desire to become a civil engineer more alive and exciting. So now everyone, we are moving on to the question and answer portion of the program. Please type in your question for our speakers. Your executives will be checking it uh, to ask our speakers. Or you can directly address your, your question by raising your hand so you will be noticed and allowed to talk. Uh, we have some questions from speakers before. The first question is from Nelson, and it's for everyone. It's uh, I'm, all the speakers. He's asked, he's a mechanical engineer in his home country. What would you recommend him to do to validate his career and start working in the area or in Canada? Justin, would you like to go first? Uh, I can. Uh, I think, Nanda, you might have some more experience in how people have uh, transitioned their overseas experience um, into Canada, but I can speak from, from what I've seen in the industry. Depending on what you did, like this is a really wide open question, um, can a mechanical engineer from overseas get a mechanical engineering job in Canada? Yes, you can. Is there a lot of variables to consider? 100%. Um, should you reach out to PEO and see what certifications you might need to get or what courses you might need to attain to make sure that you can get your PNG or your, uh, your degree recognized in Canada? Yes, you should. Um, in terms of where those individuals end up, well, a lot of them do end up in construction, but I think a lot of them enter the engineering workforce as well. Um, I think this is a longer conversation that we could take offline if you wanted to reach out to me directly. Nanda. Thank you, Justin. Um, well, that's a very interesting question. I get asked that quite a bit because I have, I've had students who are educated from outside of Canada and, and uh, they want to know how to, uh, how to break into the Canadian uh, job market. Um, well, the first thing I, I would do is I would actually make sure that your degree is recognized here in Canada, um, in Ontario. Uh, there is a third party that PEO, I think, goes through. And you can check their website. They have a, they have a, a page devoted to international graduates. But um, there is a third party that looks over uh, degrees and certifies that, that um, that your degree is valid in Canada. So once that has happened, and, and it's equivalent to a, 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 what's called a Canadian Engineering Accreditation Board um, University. Uh, so once it's, it's the equivalent of accredited um, university, uh, you, could, you might have to take technical tests. That's another thing that, that, uh, that I should warn you about. But besides that, I, I think, um, you know, if you have employment here and, and uh, you, uh, your degree is recognized here, then you, then you can uh, go forth and uh, get your, your um, credentials as a professional engineer. Um, I, I think there might, might be a few more steps, but that's basically it. Um, and then you also have to write the professional practice exam, which is very easy. Um, but uh, besides that, uh, I think you should be fine. Um, but I guess the, the first, I guess even before all that, you should try to find a job here in, 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 in uh, in Ontario, um, and uh, Justin has alluded to that. Uh, so um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you for both if, your answers. If I may say a couple of comments, sorry, uh, not to interfere, uh, but sorry, just a quick uh, introduction about myself. Um, I am a professional engineer and I just got elected to, to the PEO Council. Uh, what uh, Nanda was saying, I think I know him from Willowdale Hall chapter. Um, you don't have, he was basically saying that there's a third party, which is Engineers Canada, RCCP, Canadian Council of Professional Engineers, which in which validate your degree. There's a fee to that. Um, and um, it's not sorry, necessary. Sir, it's not, 
it's not necessary that PEO will recognize it, uh, their, their accreditation. If you are, and uh, if, and first, and of course you get job first, it's better if you directly apply to PEO and let them have an assessment art and they will say how many courses you have to do, uh, uh, technical courses, uh, not, not PPE, which is, which is uh, open for everyone. It has Sir, to I'm sorry to have to, yeah. like, this is uh, like, we can discuss this afterwards. Like we can have a different discussion to open after the presentation, then we can go with that because we are on a short, like on a limited time. You have to continue with the questions and answers whoever has questions. So you have to proceed with the program. But either way, I think that was great information that he, uh, he showed us. Um, our next question is specifically addressed to Justin. It, um, it's from Rush, Rushi, and she asked, does the recruiter normally consider the first step to shortlist the profile as LinkedIn or extranet career website? Which one is the best approach to apply to a job? That's a good question. Um, so I guess there's a couple of different ways to look at it. And again, you know, to use a recent example, one of the, the folks here that, um, that helped organize this presentation, he had applied to one of our roles. And when I first was introduced to him, he'd asked me like, hey, like I applied, like have, has anyone seen my resume? And when I looked at that background there, there was another 1500 people that had applied. So realistically, you know, you have to consider a few different things the size of the company, the specific role you're applying to, what the market looks like in terms of you know, how many applicants there might be. Um, so do I think that you shouldn't apply? No, 100% you should apply. But what, what eventually happened was I'd mentioned this to him and I said, okay, here's where you can clean up your resume and here's, some, here's a few things. I'll put this forward, understanding that I've met you. Um, but like in the future, like you need to really follow this up and you follow that up through reaching out to folks, whether that's LinkedIn or if you call them directly or whatever it is, whatever you're most comfortable with, you do need to have that follow up. And he took that advice. He actually reached out to one of our hiring managers directly over LinkedIn and built that connection, sent the resume, and now the resume is being reviewed internally. So I don't think either is a right or wrong way. I think you need to find a combination of both of those things to help get you in front of someone and so that they know that who, who they're, you're talking to and what makes you special. Hope, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you so much for the answer, Justin. Uh, we have someone who raised their hand. It's Nifimi. If you wanna open your mic to ask your question, that'd be amazing. Hi, I hope you guys can hear me. Thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate the information. And thank you so much to LOSPE for, you know, organizing this. My question is, okay, so I'm seeing that there are a lot of like civil-esque <laughs> disciplines on the forum. I am more of the chemical side. And I guess my question is more like in regards to someone who was not practicing or in any way, um, connected to the civil industry is there any way to are there any jobs in there for someone that is out of that discipline so are there any interdisciplinary um positions in companies that you know are solely like for example your construction business for example like um what are your thoughts in that regard i hope that makes sense thank you yeah i, I can i can take that and then if uh, nanda or, or the other speakers want to address it as well they can they can add to it um in terms of chemical engineering you know it depends what you want right like again start with your why if you wanted to get into construction do we have chemical engineering graduates that work in construction 100 percent, we do do they practice their chemical engineering on a day-to-day -day basis no they do not is their practical knowledge in engineering useful is it transferable yeah i think a lot of it is I think it often depends on what you're getting involved in as well. Um, we don't just build buildings and, and transit systems. Like we build refineries. We've built for oil and gas. We've built for Nova Chemicals. We've built, recently we're building for Rockport, um, which is an insulation company. So all of these 
different companies have chemical components to what we're building. So I think having that understanding and having that background in chemical engineering does serve a purpose for you if you wanted to enter construction. If you wanted to enter engineering consulting, like it's a whole other ball game. Like they have specialists in chemical engineering. I know a number of them. I've worked with a number of them at Hatch and SNC and Stantec that are specialists in that section. And they're working in mining and oil and gas and manufacturing and construction. There's there's a lot of different avenues for you to explore. It just it has to start with what you want and then try to explore from there. Thank you, Justin. I, I have to admit, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Are you asking if there's a, a, an interface between chemical and construction? Or are no. you just, uh, go ahead. Sorry, not necessarily, because I know that the disciplines do cross in some way or form. I guess my question is just maybe, maybe in terms of like the competitiveness um would there ideally be a a winning chance for a chemical engineer in a, in a completely different discipline um driven company i get i guess that is my question yeah um in a company that is very clearly a mechanical engineering company and markets themselves so would someone from a slightly different discipline but is still engineering um stand a chance i guess in the recruitment process well, I, I guess it depends on the position. Um, there, there is a, there is a um, interrelationship between the di different disciplines. And, and for example, in in civil, uh, the closest I, I think that that it comes to chemicals is the the whole realm of um, chemical engineering positions. For example, uh, in chemical engineering, uh, sorry, environmental engineering. Sorry, environmental engineering. I, I remember when I took it back at at U of T back back in the stone ages. Um, it, environmental engineering, there, it used to be, part of it was in civil and the other part was in chemical. And uh, after I graduated, that's when they combined both of them in, into, one, in one, into one department, environmental engineering. But there is like a, a, um, um, a, um, uh, an interrelationship uh, between the two for sure. Um, it's uh, it, it's a, actually a very good combination. Uh, so I mean, there are there are positions out there that uh, that um, uh, would require uh, your skills, and uh, uh, certainly in civil there are some uh, there are some positions. Uh, Justin alluded to um, in construction. Uh, I think I think that one of the things you have to keep in mind is that when you have an engineering diploma or a degree. Uh, you have a, a bunch of skills that can be marketable to a to a, a number of, of careers, and 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 it could could very well be that that in construction or something like that there is an opportunity for you. So um, I would encourage you to 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 do that as much as possible. Now you might you might actually get into one of these fields and realize later on that you have to go for further training, but that's something that that's uh, you know you can explore at a later date. So. Um, good luck to you, and I think that's a that was a great question. Thank you. Thank you so and much. Thank, thank you, you. And everybody. To build on that, and um, there's there's so much investment right now from the government into construction and new projects that it's going to get to a point where you know it's not going to matter if this person's a civil engineer or this person's a chemical engineer. It's going to be very much reminiscent of who can do the job better, who's going to do, who's going to work the hardest, who's going to have the best personality, who's the most trainable. Um, because the transit systems are going to need hundreds of people, if not thousands. And there's definitely opportunity for you. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Nanda. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, just to make note of my message in the chat box, uh, we are running out of time. So we are asking everybody that has asked their questions, we will be communicating with you. Um, or if you want to, you can also email the email address provided in the chat at 128 PM, um, with regards to your questions and we will be answering them or connecting to, with you to the speaker regarding your question. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so we have to move on to the, our final portion of the program, which is our contest. So Alex, right before you, we go forward. Um, and 
for whoever who is here attending right now and they're looking to get their hours for their engineering hours, we can provide you a certificate. And if you guys need that, you can email me. Uh, it's there at sgazi5 at myseneca.ca. We can provide you with a certification that you guys attended. We would also like to take this time to show our appreciation for our professor who has been supporting us throughout the development of our club and the developing of this event. On behalf of Seneca Civil Society, we would like to thank you, Bassam Telkadi, for your uh, efforts and your guidance. Thank you, um, Alex, and uh, to all the SES executives. It has been an honor, first as a student, to be a part of um, this uh, club when I was uh, at Seneca College, and now to also now be an advisor for the Seneca Civil Society. So I'm very thankful and grateful. And um, I wish you guys all the best in all the events that you continue to do for this school and for the club. And I thank you all. Thank you. Um, Siddharth, I believe it is time for the Kahoot game. Sorry, everyone, for the delay. Hi, guys. So, all of you, did you enjoy today's seminar? Maybe in the chat if you find found the seminar today. Inform. Okay, thank you. So, as promised, uh, now we are going to start with the Kahoot. And the winners will be declared immediately. And the gift card will be sent via email. So if you just give me a second, I'll post the codes for the Kahoot on the chat. And um, sorry, Siddharth, do you mind? Do you have the poster for the prizes? Actually, I think I have it. Um, so for our Kahoot game, we actually have a few, and I'm just going to share my screen, sorry. As you can see, our first prize winners will receive a $50 gift card to Visa MasterCard. Second prize will be winning a $25 gift card to Starbucks. And our third prize winners will be winning a $10 gift card to Starbucks. So I hope you paid attention during the presentations. Now passing it back to Siddharth. Okay, so if uh, everyone could join the links. Yes, Ned. <laughs> okay, excellent, excellent. Maybe you can share your screen. Yeah, one sec. There we go. Perfect. Alex, you're going to play as well. <laughs> I'm just here to participate. I would actually take the prize if I win, though. <laughs> I love you, and I think by myself.
Okay, I'm gonna wait for one more minute and then we'll start. Yeah. I think that's all we have remaining 48 participants, not including the uh, uh, host. Sudar, so I, think Sudar, I think you wanna start. Yeah. Just go. Okay, let's see. Excellent. Okay. Hey, okay, great. So I'm going to leave. Okay. Great. Hey, excellent work, Leah. Bradley as well. Okay. Okay, excellent. Right. Oh, Bradley is getting a lot. <laughs> nice. Great. Okay. Excellent work, Joe, Nishant, VB. <laughs> Professor Nanda is going to be proud of these answers. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Nice. Okay. Excellent work, Roman. It was 2007, I believe, if I'm not wrong. Oh, VB, excellent work. Who wants it bad? Let's see. Keep trying. Okay, great work. 
Word vocal, yeah. For building your brand, only direct networking are important. True or false? Yeah, excellent work, people. Two, most them three in a row. It's back in the game. Yeah, Leah's jumping the line yeah. pretty quick. It's in the podium already. How many accredited civil engineering programs are there in Ontario? Ten. Eight, twelve, or fifteen. Twelve. Twelve. Is this the final one? Let's go. Last question, please. Oh, Pathways for CBT at Seneca are available at Lakehead University, McMaster, and Queen. True or false? I know that one. You applied? <laughs> yeah. There we go. Let's see who our winners are. For the third one. Leah, great work. Leah. Roman. Roman. Very good. And, and first is Nishan. Yeah. Congratulations. Excellent work. Excellent work. Here. Okay, I'm taking a picture. Yeah. So Perfect. if you don't mind for those three winners, please email me your uh, email me so we can forward the gift cards to you. Yes, I'm providing the email in the chat box now. Oh, there it is. So please email Eskazi with a screenshot of your Kahoot, if you could, um, just to verify that it's you. All right. Um, now to end off our event, um, if you could switch back to our Canva, Siddharth, to our last slide. Um, we would like to thank everyone for attending today. We hope you have enjoyed our session. We'd also like to thank OSPE, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, for organizing them this year. Lastly, a very special thank you to all of our NEM partners who are noted on this slide. Join us to other NEM events. Check out nemontario.ca for a complete listing of all events this month. See you there and have an awesome day. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you all so much. Happy National Engineering Month. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Happy Professional Engineers Day. Same to you, sir. <laughs> Please don't forget if you are a winner to email unless you're, you want to forfeit your prize, which I don't, I don't know why you would, but <laughs> um, please email. And uh, don't forget the screenshot just for verification purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Nanda. Thank you. Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Alex. <laughs>